this coordination in the brain has different parts, which controls different parts of the body, different senses, those are to be coordinated. It's a command center of the brain. It's called reticular formation. And yet, as I work from chakra to chakra, there's a clear sense that Ajna chakra is thought of as a cone, a cone, like, you know, ice cream cone. Don't eat ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> the base of the cone is in the front. The apex or the tip of the cone is in the back. In, in your, in your, Image, think of that as the, the very tip of the cone, which is in the back, connects to this reticular formation. That's the image. Psychologically, what happens is there are negative emotions that often overwhelm you. Sometimes very strongly, sometimes not so strongly. Now, <clears throat> take anger for example. Something happens in life, somebody offends me or hurts me, and I'm angry at that person. Consider legitimate. However, uh, I briefly mentioned this, you know, there is an accident or a car that drives badly, the driver has gone away, I'm still angry. On superficially, I think I'm expressing anger at that person. But who is it hurting when the person is not even there? I'm hurting myself. And where does that hurt immediately register in your physiological system? Is in your breath. But as I breathe and I find out the, the Kundalini energy rising from chakra to chakra, it doesn't quite move from Ajna chakra back into the into the middle. To do that, to train your subconscious, recognizing what is causing that impediment, is your emotion, negative emotion. You think of this chakra as on inhalation, Whatever energy is negative goes to this Ajna Chakra. Think of the Ajna Chakra as, as a black hole. Yeah. Our concept of black hole is what? It is so dense, so heavy, that anything that approaches it gets sucked into it. Nothing comes out of it. We take that concept and say, okay, whatever is negative comes into the Ajna Chakra, gets back into the infinite past doesn't come out. What comes out on exhalation is constant love. So close your eyes. <coughs> Think of any negative emotion you might have. Doesn't have to be something very strong. Can be very strong. Doesn't have to be. Something you are upset about. That energy affects you, your whole system. So what you do here is on inhalation, keeping the breath within comfortable level. On inhalation, it comes to this Ajna Chakra, sucks, it sucks back into the infinite past. On exhalation, all that comes out is love. You have the God-given strength to deal with anything negative like that, that is simply bothering you by memory. When you consciously use this, any method really, this is one method, to remove that. Understanding that, you know, continuously reminding yourself of something that happened in the past, 
past that you don't like, is of no real value. The only value remembering something like that might have is you don't repeat that. But whatever bothered you, particularly big things, did not happen just once. It repeatedly happened and you ignored it. You made a serious for it. You meaning not you per se, your mind. So it takes a little time to wash away that. <coughs> but you can wash it away. If you say, no, I can't wash it away, that means you believe you are not human. Not possible. Connection to the remote viewing <coughs> is that when your sense is functioning in a very receptive way, it affects your breath in a good way. There is a concept within our tradition <coughs> that you go to a master, seeing the master physically, the word given is darshan. Darshan means you, you, you saw the person. But darshan also has very subtle meaning in that if seeing the person is not just physical, but it is an expression of love, you go to a master, you love the master. Simply physically seeing the master is not going to do anything. But there is a sense of love that does a tremendous thing. So much so that then master doesn't have to be within your proximity. Master can be away in India. You just think of the master and this sense of love arises. Very deep affection. That is also darshan. When darshan happens, whether through memory or actually, what is affected is your breath. Most people, kind of amusingly, think of that breath in the chest. Yeah. That's only the emotional part that is released. How does breathing become? How does it start? In a human body, the allopathic concept is that you have a diaphragm. Di diaphragm contracts, creates partial vacuum in your lungs, the air automatically rushes in. The diaphragm becomes a dome shape again, there is more pressure out there, and the acceleration becomes. This is a basic concept. It's not as simple as that, but it's enough to start with. The yogic understanding is that the breathing begins in your pelvic floor. There is the throat diaphragm. There is, the, uh, there is a concept of middle chest diaphragm, which is where if you are trying to deeper breath, there is a barrier here. So you take a comfortably deep breath, then there is a blockage. You go past that blockage in pranayama. That is the middle chest diaphragm. Then there is your diaphragm, what is known as diaphragm, the, uh, abdominal diaphragm. Then there is a concept of navel diaphragm, and finally, the pelvic floor diaphragm. Pelvic floor diaphragm, all of them are dome shaped. All the diaphragms are dome shaped. The misunderstanding has been for a long time that the pelvic floor diaphragm is a trough. It is not. It is also a dome. Why did this mis misunderstanding come around? Because when they looked at dead bodies, which is how we learn anatomy, 
in that body, in that lifetime, has completely collapsed. By looking at it, the conclusion was drawn that that diaphragm is strong. It's not. Now, with our modern instruments, we can see that it is also gone. So, for the breath to begin, same happens to this diaphragm in the pelvic floor. It flattens it, never goes completely flat. It will completely flat you are either dead or at least uh, unconscious. You faint it. So, it, it does the same thing as the thoracic diaphragm. The breath begins in the pelvic. When the diaphragm flattens a little, pelvic and abdominal organs seated on the diaphragm come to rest, which allows your thoracic diaphragm to function more efficiently. This is where sometimes it is taught, you know, this abdominal breath. Abdominal breath doesn't mean your air goes in there, but the energy goes there. As the pelvic floor diaphragm settles, pelvic and, uh, pelvic and abdominal organs settle, so the thoracic diaphragm can function more efficiently, more freely. So our yogic concept is the breath does not begin in the diaphragm, nor in the intercostal muscles. It begins in the pelvic floor. Just with that idea, take a few breaths. Let the breath begin comfortably in the pelvic floor. So, with some attention, when you are trying to sense something, it's not with your eyes, ears and so on, which is fine, but you are trying to sense something emotionally, which is the root of the remote viewing. Then, the way that is reflected in your breath, touches the pelvic floor. If you think of somebody you love, who is not here, who is far away, that feeling is not reflected just in your chest. It begins in the pelvic floor. And the breath immediately reflects it. So a clearer understanding of that diaphragm <coughs> would help your breath, the way the breath relates to emotion, and hence help this remote viewing. Not absolutely necessary, but definitely helpful. So if I may pick on my favorite person, Take a pillow if you want. <coughs> As she inhales, the diaphragm flattens, the belly goes up in normal breathing. As she exhales, the belly goes down. That is the normal breathing. Pranayamic concept is that the belly doesn't go up and down. It might slightly, but every time I talk to Miss Nagar, he says, no. Because he says, if I accept that when he goes up and down, then you will do more. So he completely refuses that the belly moves up and down. So will I for the next couple of hours. <laughs> my teacher comes. If you don't have to, you can talk to him. Yeah. So belly goes up and down, except we are saying, not up and down so much, but violence. The sense of the belly on inhalation, it divides. 
by Betty, I mean all the Betty can not Ben did this. Put, it here. Put your hands on the belly. <coughs> not strongly, but just reasonably firm. Yeah. Lift your feet up. And what happens is this tightens and the whole thing goes up. Come down. When you think of lifting the legs, you are using so-called abdominal strength. That is what makes the belly go up. What you want to use for this is your pelvic strength. So obviously I can't do this with everybody, but if I do it with my favorite person, I need a roll. No. She did not a bit. She was kidding. Like he is drinking. She is drinking. Do you need a doubt? I put this here. Okay. And Give it some pressure. So you are engaging the Buddha Bandha. My knee appears to be on the floor, it's not, it's a little higher off the floor. So I press on that Buddha Bandha. The more I press, the more she is able to lift the legs up. I think. Now, you can lift the legs up without the belly going up and down. In fact, so-called abdominal strength is not even necessary. The leg basically flies up. Okay. Initially, you do it with somebody's help. Later, if you want to do it on your own, give me that block, please. And I need one more block behind you. <coughs> you lie down on a sticky mat, put one rock like that, the other one this way. So you have enough room for your feet here. Bring the feet here. <coughs> lie down with that this block touching me, carrying him fairly strongly. Then lift it the result and put this between the block and that. So when you lie down against it, this is firmly supported. And then see how the legs go up. No strength here is required. Mm -hmm. Later all this gadget is not necessary. Just in your mind, lifting the bed and you do it. There are other ways of doing it, but the belt and so on, we won't get into that. But the idea behind doing this is to learn and have a very clear concept in your feeling that the breath begins in the pelvic floor, it does not begin with your diaphragm. So, I will go get some chai, <laughs> help each other. If you feel comfortable, work with somebody. If not, arrange this kind of movement against the wall, lying down and seeking that. If you put your hands here, with your fingers, now poke a little bit both your hands. Or more near them. And learn to lift up without this going up and down. Another way to become more professional with it is keep the legs lifted. This comes up first, yes? Okay. Keep the legs lifted without dropping the legs down. Take this part that became hard. Hardness is good, it should be found, but it should not lift up. So keeping the fingers there, encourage that area to go towards the floor and widen. Yes. Okay, shall we try or do? Two. 